this is a global coordinated race to the bottom in a sense, right? And that's uh, from a currency perspective. I think that's what you're talking about where you have more and more negative real interest rates. And the biggest thing is, is the policymakers around the world have basically given up the ability to fight it by raising interest rates because they can't raise interest rates because, you know, what happens to the consumer and the corporate entities in the U.S. and abroad when all of a sudden, you know, their 1% floating rate uh, interest rates or their, you know, 2.5% fixed rate interest rates go to 10%. Well, like that's catastrophic for the economy. So I- I'm, I'm not sure how we get out of this except... But you start hearing the prevalence of, you know, discussions about modern monetary theory and what does that mean, right? Uh, Keep your interest rates low, print money, and people will still feel wealthy because your asset prices will inflate. If you're a homeowner, your house price will go up, you know, it'll be fine. Except that two, three, four percent a year, if you have accumulated wealth, that two, three, four percent a year is just going to erode. And for all that, you know, we've we've learned the benefit of compounding interest as an investor, compounding deflation is savage. Welcome to another RTD interview. Today, I'm excited to have first time guest, Mr. Dan Wilton, the CEO of First Mining Gold Corp. And today he's joining us to share his thoughts on the economy, precious metals, as well as opportunities in the mining space. So Dan, welcome to RTD interviews. Well, Mike, thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you taking time uh, and sitting down with us. As I mentioned before, we had a chance to connect with Keith Newmeyer uh, a few weeks ago, who gave us pretty much the surface of what's going on with First Mining Gold. So I'm looking forward to diving in deeper with someone in the driver's seat uh, over the Mm. company as a CEO. So uh, before we get into all that, I'm curious to find out a little bit more about you. Can you share with Mm -hmm. the audience a brief snippet as to a little bit of your background and how you've arrived at this point in your career? Sure. Yeah. So my background, I've been working in finance in the mining industry since the early 1990s. So I've actually seen a few cycles, Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a helpful thing when you look at at where we are now in context. Um, And for about 20 years was a corporate finance and mergers and acquisitions advisor and then spent about five years as uh, a partner in a mining focused investment fund. We had $800 million under management investing in mostly development stage projects around the world in mining. So have, I think, a a decent sense of political risk and what it's like to invest in different areas. And and ultimately where that leads to a bit is sometimes the appreciation for the value of some assets that you can like touch and feel, you know, that's, uh, it's important. So I've been the CEO of First Mining Gold for about two and a half years. And just a very quick snippet on that, we have a portfolio of gold development projects, all of them in Canada, great jurisdictions, and we're uh, really focused on advancing our Spring Pole project, which is one of the largest undeveloped gold projects in the sector. All right. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you for sharing that. And so I want to dive right in. So what I like to do primarily is talk about the issues we face so people can get an understanding of how important it is to then be able to brace and prepare and take action, you know, actionable steps towards preserving, protecting your purchasing power in the days ahead. And so in the mainstream news right now, the primary subject happens to be around inflation. And here in the U.S., yes. numbers have came out last couple of months that I've been have overshot the Federal Reserve's target. And of course, they're saying brace for more because it's going to continue for quite some time. But it's transitory. So don't worry about it. It'll go back to yeah, normal. But don't- but don't worry, there's no inflation. Exactly. And so I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, what, why are we seeing this right now? And what are your anticipation for how this will transpire in the days ahead? What concerns you and, and, and why at this current moment? Yeah, well, listen, there's, uh, uh, I, I think when you look at this inflation situation, it's concerning. I think, you know, number one, what's the Fed's target for inflation? Do they have one? Have they changed it? In my mind, when you look at it, I think I think the Fed's given up on inflation mm-hmm. and I think they've given up on inflation because they don't really have an alternative at this point. So you have inflation that's coming in, you know, it's looking like five, six percent a year. You know what, the, what that actually means? And, and we lose sight of this. It means we're sitting with negative real interest rates at an unprecedented level. You know, negative real interest rates today, if you're if you're looking at, you know, short term rates, your real interest rates are 
you know, minus 4%. And that does some really strange things to asset values and distorts asset prices in the market. And I think you've seen that with, you know, equity prices that are through the roof. I think you've seen that with housing prices in a lot of markets. So, um, you know, I, I think that is a real cause for concern because I don't think this inflation is transitory. I think, you know, we're seeing this inflation before everyone really gets back to work coming out of a global pandemic. Right. And we haven't really seen the wage push inflation. That's coming. And when we start seeing that, that's going to get very reminiscent of, you know, the 80s and, you know, even, even the early 90s. Um, you think about where interest rates went in, in, you know, recessions in the early 90s. It's, it was tough. So... Right. Um, not, not least of which, you know, in and, in and around where you live, you think about the experience of, of people through the early 90s. It was, that was a tough time, right? right, right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, this inflation is, is a real problem. I don't think it's transitory. And I think, you know, we need to start thinking about, and it, it, the part that gets me is even if it is transitory, don't worry, Mike, it's, it's only like two years of five, maybe 10% inflation. You know what that is? That's a 20% depreciation of your wealth. Right, right? very true. What do you think about that if, you, if it's sitting in dollars in the bank? So yeah, uh, I don't know. I think this is a time when people really need to be thinking about that wealth preservation angle here. Right, right. I do agree. And so that's one of the things I try to focus on this channel as well. But yet, you know, in normal time, not normal times, but, you know, every country has their own issues that they're battling. All mm -hmm. governments, all central banks are responding the same, same way. So it's not just an isolated event here in the U.S. It just right. so happens that all eyes are on the Federal Reserve because we have the reserve status. But I'd imagine in the Canadian region, you guys have similar formats of, you know, numbers that are increasing in the inflation side and Europe and things like that. So, yeah. so share with me your thoughts on that, because it's just not an isolated event. It's global and it, it's taken us somewhere where we've never been as an entire I guess human species, I guess. I'm no. not sure. What are your I, thoughts? I, what, give me your thoughts on that. I think that's exactly right. This is a global coordinated, global coordinated race to the bottom, in a sense, right? And that's uh, from a currency perspective. I think that's what you're talking about, where you have negative, you know, more and more negative real interest rates. And, and the biggest thing is, is the policymakers around the world have basically given up the ability to fight it by raising interest rates because they can't raise interest rates because, you know, what happens to the consumer and the corporate entities in the U.S. and abroad when all of a sudden, you know, their 1% floating rate uh, interest rates or their, you know, 2.5% fixed rate interest rates go to 10%. Well, like that's catastrophic for the economy because everyone has borrowed as much money as they possibly can because real interest rates are negative, right? So it just, it starts leading to kind of globally, um, globally profound, really dangerous. And I think, you know, um, challenging to recover from economic behavior. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how we get out of this, except for, you know, you start hearing the prevalence, and I was talking about this a couple of years ago, but you start hearing the prevalence of, you know, discussions about modern monetary theory, and what does that mean, right? Well, modern monetary theory means, you know, we're actually going to lead this globally coordinated race to the bottom on exchange rates, because, you know, our people don't really need to travel. There's lots of great places you can go on holiday in the U.S., and you know, it's a it's a strong enough domestic economy. Uh, keep your interest rates low, print money, and people will still feel wealthy because your asset prices will inflate. If you're a homeowner, your house price will go up. You know, it'll be fine. Except that two, three, four percent a year. If you have accumulated wealth, that two, three, four percent a year is just going to erode. And for all that you know, we've we've learned the benefit of compounding interest as an investor compounding deflation is savage. And I'll tell you, Mike, one of the, one of the experiences in my life that was really fundamentally changing for me, I spent some time in Russia in 1997. I lived in St. Petersburg for three months uh, and was living with an old pensioner couple. And these were a couple who were, you know, the, the straight down the fairway Soviet citizens worked their whole lives both engineers dedicated to the, you know, dedicated to the 
to the country. And uh, they got to their retirement age with a fixed pension, which was great. You know, it was they had an apartment, they had a car uh, and their fixed pension would have been like, you know, 100 rubles a month, let's say, which was great when the ruble was one to one to the U.S. dollar. Right. And, you know, food prices were controlled. Well, they started devaluing the ruble. By the time I got there, it was 5,000 to the dollar. Wow. So just imagine all of you, you assume you are, you're set up for life as a pensioner. And now all of a sudden, all you have is your apartment. All you have is your car and you got to figure out, you know, how you're going to, how you're going to survive. But that that's not an isolated case. Like people talk about, oh, the Weimar Republic, like, you know, it's, it hasn't really happened. To, it has happened. It's happened in a lot of places. And I'm not saying it's going to happen in the U.S. I think it will be slower and, uh, and, you know, a little more sneaky in the U.S. over, over a 10 year period as you figure out how we're going to deal with unprecedented monetary stimulus. But the one thing I would say is like the cat's out of the bag. The money's been spent, right? The trillions and trillions of dollars of fiscal and monetary stimulus, you're, you're not pulling that back out of the economy at any time soon. So the, the, the best case scenario is it's kind of a, a one step, you know, step change because we've inflated the money supply by this much, but don't worry, we're not going to do it anymore. I don't know. I get, right. I get skeptical. Right. It doesn't make sense whatsoever. And I, I use a lot of, you like use a lot of key buzzwords that I use uh, in my little rant sometime, but you know, as you hinted at earlier, you know, all time high asset valuations, equity markets, housing boom, consumer debt through the world. I mean, there's so, it's so many all time highs in a, and what is being used to prop and keep things afloat. But yet, of course, precious metals, the primary one, gold and silver, hasn't moved. But, yeah. you know, there's a lot of economists out here, Austrian school economists, talking about a correction is coming. There has to be some type of realization that things are just beyond control. And I'm assuming a lot of people might be concerned with that. You know, is that, in your opinion, is that something that is inevitable in our future, near future, long term future? And I'm assuming why, because of all the promises that's been made. But, what would that look like in your opinion, based upon prior historical events that you just gave us about Russia? Oh, you know, I, I, I it's tough to forecast. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I think this one here is going to be slower and a bit more insidious than it is going to be a, a big correction. But listen, I think, I don't know, I've been proven wrong before, but, uh, you know, in 2000, when technology stocks were crazy and people put you know, multi-billion or tens of billions of dollars of value on companies that were never going to generate a profit like that. That was a speculative boom because capital was chasing opportunity. Um, the, the one thing that I'm, I, you know, I've spent my whole career in the mining business. The one thing I can say is if there's a sector that's seen a lack of capital investment, it's the mining sector. And we're going to start seeing what that means. What that's going to mean is, is more, um, Inflation, which is going to be driven by commodity prices, because there's just this pent up need for investment, not just in <clears throat> in gold and silver, but in, in copper and nickel and all these other metals that we use every day that, you know, people don't think about. But I, I think this correction, you know, I, I think there could be, a, I, I don't know, you know, 20, 30 percent. Uh, correction down in the equity market, you know, not across all sectors, but just in the frothy stuff. Um, and that will have some follow on impacts because you know, who's, uh, funding all of these, you know, billion dollar unicorn venture investors. It's, it's your pension funds. Mm -hmm. It's your university endowments. It's, it's the things that people are relying on trying to chase a little bit of extra yield. Why? <laughs> because your interest rates, you have negative real interest rates and you can't buy fixed income, you know, and generate a real return in this environment without taking enormous risk. So I, I think it's got to correct at some point. You cannot, you cannot ad infinitum shovel money out the door and have a, a monetary system that incentivizes you to, you know, borrow and speculate because money, not money's not only free, they're they're paying you to take it. So we're gonna see the the only outcome of that is inflation, right? The only outcome is inflation of asset prices and ultimately inflation of consumer prices, I think. So um, at some point, there has to be a reckoning. Um, 
if you think through the logic of the reckoning, then it's going to be higher interest rates. Those higher interest rates are going to depress economic activity. You're going to have masses of bankruptcies. Um, you know, uh, you'll have banks fail in some instances. Not the first time we've seen this, and it's not. You know, it's not uh, it's not that you can't recover from it. I don't know that it's going to cause you know system wide collapse. You certainly hope it doesn't. Right. But there's there's a there's a big chunk of everyone's net worth I think that is at risk if you're just invested in the equity markets and right. and fixed income. Right, I do agree. I do agree. And so uh, this show here is called Rethinking a Dollar, and I always like to get uh, viewers or the guest viewpoints on just the reserve status of the dollar because of the Federal Reserve note, aka the dollar, is the primary tool being used to keep things propped up. And I call it, you know, they're trying to keep liquidity in the monetary pipeline globally because dollars are needed for debt. And you name it, we got the Euro dollar. We got all types of instruments labeled a dollar that these days. But in the last year, you know, February, 2020, it was $4 trillion on the M1 money stock. And as of this past May, it was $19 trillion. So that's a nice, you know, nice exponential spike upwards of M1 yeah. money supply. Yeah. So in your opinion, how much can the U.S. continue to run this type of policies, fiscal as well as monetary, and other nations will continue to follow suit and stay in line and just allow the U.S. to continue to abuse the reserve status for that for, for in a short term or long term? What are your thoughts? Well, I think in the short term, it's going to be that globally coordinated race to the bottom that we've all talked about, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 you're not going to feel like, you know, your uh, the dollar's losing much ground if the euro's losing ground at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So if everyone's doing it, then you'll still be able to travel to France. It'll be nice. Like, it yeah. won't seem really expensive. But there are countries, you've already seen the crack in the cartel. Right. Mm. And this is where it strains from monetary policy into geopolitics. Mm. And, you know, you've seen China start actively moving away from using the dollar as a reserve currency. You've seen a bunch of central banks. I mean, just look over the last few years, largest buyers of gold are central mm. banks. You've had Russia, which has outright replaced the U.S. dollar with gold as its as its core you know, uh, reserve currencies. So um, we haven't come to realize that that's happening yet, but it's, you know, it's in kind of tier one, tier two, and tier three countries. People are starting to be concerned and diversify away. So, um, and, and longer term, I, I just, I don't think a, a sustained race to the bottom is ever going to win for anyone because history says that at some point, there's a reckoning, right? At some at some point, the value of the reserve currencies that others are holding are going to put the rest of us in a in a really tricky position when it then costs them nothing to come over here and buy our stuff, right? right. Like, right. and by our stuff, I mean our companies, and you know, to buy productive capacity and buy hard assets and buy commodities and everything else like that's the fall one of that if you think that you know China and Russia end up with with a, a non-US dollar based reserve currency and you continue to devalue the US dollar where it could get to a you know a crisis point at some point um, that just you know strategically should make us all a little uncomfortable about what could happen from that. Right, right. And I think as you're describing that, you know, that was going to lead to my next point about how <laughs> ultimately that's that's been labeled as the de-dollarization process, which I try to document as much as I can here. Yeah. And so it, it clearly gold is in the future uh, plans of central banks as well as governments worldwide. And so just recently, I think as of last month, I think uh, Brazil uh, basically brought out, I think, 41 thousand 41 thousand 41 tons or something something yeah. huge yeah and that's kind of large for a country like brazil that hasn't had major issues so clearly yeah. the move away from dollars underway and i just love to get people's thoughts and of course with i don't want to forget silver for the we the people like you know the, the small fries out of the group you know but i'm curious to get your thoughts now let's just transition into just the, the precious metal space in general mm -hmm. as well as uh first mining gold so yeah. share with us so, so you're in the driver's seat to first mining gold give us some uh, of the opportunities that's available there now and so people can get a perspective of the physical as well as exposure <laughs> to the mining space if you don't mind Sure. Yeah. And we were talking about this uh, just before we kind of started the recording that, yeah. you know, I've been I've been active in the precious metals uh, industry and, and financing uh, precious metals and, and mining companies for 30 years. 
Um, I, I think there's what, what I always found interesting is there's a spectrum that can fit pretty much anyone's investment criteria somewhere in precious metals. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it's an either or. I think if you are diversifying a portfolio, you know, the, the most secure form of that investment is physical gold. And it's the most secure because in a pinch, you can put it in a backpack and, you know, uh, get out of town, right? <laughs> like right. that's, that is, that is true liberty right there. Uh, and the portability and, you know, the amount that you have to carry, um, you can, you know, you can preserve some of your wealth that way, but it's, it's, it, there, there is an element of security that I think is worth a premium for that. Mm -hmm. Then there's, uh, you know, gold miners, gold producers that are making money from gold. So they're insulated against the, against the devaluation to a degree. And in some sense, really well positioned to benefit from it, depending on how cost inflation uh, pushes up with, with gold price. You assume the gold price is going a lot higher. Because the cost inflation will push up as well, but usually there's a gap there, right? So they enhance their profitability, and that's good. <clears throat> and then, and then there's the gold developers, which is kind of where we are. And the gold developers right now have been the ignored segment of uh, of the mining industry for a long time. So you can get exploration, right? Exploration is uh, we think we found something, or we found something we don't really know what it is. And it's higher risk. You're still trying to establish, you know, geostatistically and through a lot of hard work and clever geology, what's in the ground. And then you got to turn that into a business, which is kind of what we're in the process of. So we've got at our spring pole project, uh, you know, 3.8 million ounces of reserves, which means that they're well-defined, you know, uh, 5 million ounces equivalent if you include our silver in, a, in an indicated resource. And we think there's lots of exploration potential for that to grow, but this is a project that if we could build it today, as we've scoped it with our engineering studies, would have a net present value of a billion dollars US, no, $995 million US. So, but that's at $1,600 gold. <clears throat> when you look at what the, what the value of the project is in much higher gold prices, it's about $150 million of value to the project for every $100 on the gold price. Really? So one of our shareholders, yeah. many of whom share share your views on where we're going and my views for that matter, where we're going with the gold price said, well, you know, what's what's the value of the project at, at a five thousand dollar gold price? You know, that's that's my price target. So, you know, don't talk to me about your share price. It's trading at these levels. It's you know, it's still super cheap. Yeah. So like we, we trade it at right now about one tenth of that value of the project. Right. And, and we're well funded to get the company to those value milestones. We've got a number of investments in other companies that this is a company that Keith Newmeyer started in 2015, where he basically at, at the cheapest time in probably the last 30 years to buy gold development companies. He like snapped up eight companies in 15 months. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, I, I joined blessed with this portfolio that Keith had kind of put together. Um, but it's allowed us now to go find some partners because it's starting to open up the ability for our partners to raise some money to advance their projects. We got our hands full mm -hmm. with Springpole and, and with our Cameron project and some other stuff. Um, but that's where, you know, I think we're trading at, you know, uh, call it $20 an ounce in the ground. And then today, I think it's less than that. And our peers who are developing projects trade at, you know, 80 to hundred dollars an ounce in the ground. So this is before the mine's built, but you always kind of have value metrics you look at. Yeah. So we're super cheap relative to our peers. And that means that, you know, as we advance the project, get, take it through a permitting process, develop, you know, uh, agreements and relationships with our indigenous communities, our local communities in the area, then I think we see that value go up, but it's, it's that leverage to the gold price. You just have to look at kind of what happened to our stock price last year when gold went from, you know, call it uh, what, 1500 to 20, you know, 2100, that kind of run up just after the onset of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, our share price went from 20 to, you know, almost 60 cents. So we real leverage to that increase in gold price. Yeah.
Interesting, interesting. And so as of right now, you know, share with us a little bit of the you know, Treasury Metals, the joint investment. And I guess just past, just recently you guys had an opportunity. Share with us a little bit of that insight as well. Yeah, so we are the largest shareholder of Treasury Metals uh, because last year, uh, as this, we were kind of looking for partners for our projects, uh, Treasury had a, a project that they were developing, which was kind of a, a smallish project, but they'd moved it through the permitting process, got federal environmental approvals to build a mine and mill. And we had a, a substantial gold deposit 25 kilometers away. So the logic is undeniable. Like you, you don't need to build two mills. You just basically mine at this one, mine at this one, build a bigger mill in one spot where they already have their permits. And uh, you end up having like a really interesting, robust project. So we combined those companies. We took back a bunch of shares. But one of the things when Keith set up first mining, the goal was always that when, when we find partners for these projects, at some point, we're going to return value to the shareholders. So that's, that's the big event that happened this week. Mm -hmm. is uh, as of yesterday, we actually distributed a little more than half of the shares that we own, which would be, you know, roughly $20 million worth. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of the warrants that we received in Treasury Metals from this deal directly out to our shareholders. So basically like a stock dividend. So mm -hmm. there we go. Return a little bit of value. So our share price is kind of trying to find its feet today. But, uh, you know, all of our first mining shareholders as of yesterday became Treasury metal shareholders. And I think it's it's a great project. It's if you look at the at the average analyst consensus of the research analysts that follow it, it's got a price target of kind of average of 250. It's trading at 80 cents today. So that you know, that kind of three cents, three and a half cents of value notionally based on today's market price, you know, I personally think could be, you know, could be worth, you know, 10 cents or more in a static gold environment and worth a lot more than that in, a, in an increasing gold environment. We've got a great team there that's been put together over the last six months and they're moving forward to, you know, build the mine. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it, I think it's a great investment. We're pretty, we're pretty excited about it. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a director of the company and had to do my insider filings yesterday and just kind of shook my head because I'm a big shareholder first mining gold. Like I, you know, I, and I bought, uh, other than having just exercised a few options, I bought all of my shares in the last two and a half years, you know, in financings and in the market. So like we're, you know, we're a committed group, yeah. but uh, I was surprised at how many treasury metal shares it added up to. It's like, hold on a second. That's uh, that's a substantial value. So anyway, yeah. it's exciting. That's good. That's good. So for those that might be, as I mentioned, you know, the audience is relatively new. Some of us are new mm -hmm. here with uh, just exploring opportunities such as this, because as I mentioned, I preached the importance of having physical in your hands. So that's, as you mentioned, if you need to put in the backpack, you know, do your thing yeah. from the emergency standpoint, you'll be good to go. So for a newbie, share with your, your thoughts, you know, go back in time a little <laughs> bit. You know, when you were first new into this space, you were learning some of the things that you've I guess, learn throughout your 30 years in this space that if you could go back and tell your younger self about the possibilities yeah. and opportunities, I, I'm sure I would love to hear, you know, how, how valuable is this opportunity from a, a newbie standpoint? In your yeah, opinion. listen, yeah, I, I think, again, it goes back to, um, I, there's a lot of great resources you can find um, to kind of get uh, a little bit better educated on the mining cycle itself. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of the development cycle, which the thing that I've always found fascinating with the mining industry is it's kind of a project development cycle layered over top of a commodity price cycle. Mm. And sometimes those things, you know, you, you hit the milestones at the time when the, when the commodity price is going up and it's magical. And sometimes you're doing all the right things in your company and the commodity price is going the other way mm. and it's really hard. And sometimes it doesn't really matter what you have. And we, we kind of, we saw a little bit of this last year to a degree as the gold price started running. Mm -hmm. um, you get into these environments where when the gold price runs, almost doesn't matter what you own, the rising tide is gonna, is gonna rise all boats. So what, what I think in terms of where we are now, you gotta understand where, where you think you are in the gold price cycle. Right. And you know my perspective on this, you know, I've lived through a couple of cycles, but when I go back to kind of 2003, 2004 to 2011, which in my mind was the last you know, trough to peak cycle in gold, 
it went from just under $300 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. Mm. Right. Major. That's big. So that's, that's a six X return. And then it pulled back. And I think when you look at where we have been in this cycle in this cycle, I would say started 2015, 2016, uh, which was a really dire time, but you had gold price that had pulled back to eleven hundred, you know, eleven hundred dollars an ounce. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why the trough to peak here is gonna isn't gonna be the same? Uh, no, I think you're gonna have an amplitude that's at least, uh, you know, at least three x. I think if you go back trough trough to peak gold price analyses in mm -hmm. in how it moves through a cycle. Um, I really like the bet of being 50% up off the bottom, not even 50% up off the bottom right now. You're like 35% up off the bottom on something that historically trough to peak goes up multiples, right? And when you get into that environment where you're testing the new highs, um, your return on your, on, on your physical gold, it's, that's important, right? It's great. Um, but the leverage that you get in gold mining companies and then the leverage you get in a good gold developer, um, where it's kind of, in, in my mind, I've spent most of my career like investing and financing companies in this development stage, because if you find the right team, uh, you just get such great leverage to the gold price. And you get, you know, um, something that is, it, you're, if you find the right ones and you can buy them cheap, you get them at a, at a point where, um, you're going to surface value almost irrespective of what happens in the gold price. But if you are in the right time in the sector, that's, that's when it's time to double down. So, and, and I think we're there. I think, you know, i we've been very confident in that. We've got a great team moving our projects forward. It's really hard work, but the other thing is uh, in terms of the gold mining industry, there is a real scarcity of, of projects. And this is an industry, as I said before, that has seen really very little investment from 2011 until 2020. And you just can't play catch up. It's not an industry that you can just build another factory and start building more gold, right? Like you gotta find it. You gotta go through permitting processes. You gotta build a mine. You gotta then make sure your mine's working. The lag time from discovery to production in a gold project today is 15 years. That would be the average time from when you're investing in exploration. Oh, we've discovered a new deposit. Yeah. From that time to producing is 15 years. So the way, the way that you shorten that is to look at projects that are more advanced and are being developed, which is you know, typically kind of the most boring time because you're, you're not always finding more gold. You know, we think we will. We've got a lot of exploration that we're going to do at our project. And I think demonstrate that 5 million ounces is the starting point, not the end point. But yeah, no, you can, you can get that gold at a, at a fraction of the value that, you know, that I think it's going to be worth once we get further on in the process. So it's exciting. A lot of hard work. But, you know, we get to, uh, I think, in the end, have some real... Um, some real pride in, in moving these projects forward for sure. Right. Well, Dan, thank you for sharing that. You definitely laid out a great case for why it's a, a, such a great opportunity. So I thank you for sharing your analysis perspective as well as educating the audience, because I, I like to be able to speak with people who've been in the field, know it directly, it can give it straight to us. So thank you for that. So for those that uh, do, and I also have information in the description, but can you share yeah. with us, you know, where we can find out more information on the, what's going on, how we can get involved, ticker symbol, things like that. Give yourself a yeah. chance. Absolutely. So uh, best place to start is our website, www.firstmininggold.com. Uh, we trade on the TSX ticker symbol FF and the OTCQX ticker symbol FFMGF. If you want to reach out to us, info at firstmininggold.com. Um, and you know, really delighted. It's one of the things I hope you can tell I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this, uh, about this industry. And I do, I do love talking to people who have not really looked at the industry before and, and, you know, having some of those discussions just to provide some, some education and on the ground perspective. I, I love doing it. So please don't, don't hesitate to reach out. You can sign up on our, on our email distribution list and, and uh, we'll make sure we keep you up to date.
All right, sounds good. Well, Dan, well, thank you for joining us in our today interviews. Looking forward to continuing to follow the project. And as I always say, hopefully have you back on in the future as things get rolling uh, and, and we reach a different level of pricing in the Meadows market. I would love to find out what's really going on there. And so looking forward to have you back on in the future. So thanks again for joining us on RTD interviews. Oh, Mike, thanks very much for having me. I look forward to connecting again soon.